Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the History Desk. As always, I'm Jonathan, and I'm glad you're with me to look at another historical topic. In our last episode, we looked at the Philadelphia Campaign, the battles which took place to allow the British to capture the American capital, Philadelphia. In this episode, we're going to take a step back from military actions for the most part, and look at the diplomatic efforts of the Americans, which would affect both their ability to make war and the outcome of the war itself. This will include a look at the French treaties, which are more commonly known, the Spanish, who in my opinion have been greatly forgotten as allies during the war, and the very important Dutch. Are you ready? Let's get started. We're going to start with the Dutch. In 1776, the United Provinces of Dutch of Netherlands, which we consider Dutch, were the first country to salute the flag of the United States, leading to a growing British suspicion of the Dutch. In 1778, the Dutch refused to be bullied into taking Britain's side in the war against France. The Dutch were major suppliers of the Americans. In the 13 months from 1778 to 1779, for example, 3,182 ships cleared the islands of the Dutch Republic in the West Indies. When the British started to search all Dutch shipping for weapons for the rebels, the Republic officially adopted a policy of armed neutrality. Britain declared war in December of 1780 before the Dutch could join the League of Armed Neutrality. This resulted in the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War, which diverted British resources away from the American campaigns, but ultimately confirmed a decline of the Dutch Republic. In 1782, John Adams negotiated loans of $2 million for war supplies from Dutch bankers. On March 28, 1782, after a petition, campaign on behalf of the Americans' cause organized by Adams and the Dutch patriot politician Joan van Keppelen, the United Netherlands recognized America's independence and subsequently signed a treaty of commerce and friendship. This money from the Dutch was very important to keep soldiers paid, debts paid, buy arms and ammunition, and really kept the Americans going when they were at a financial low when they didn't they were trying to produce their own money. There was an influx of counterfeiters, some, some produced by the British in an attempt to lower support or faith in this paper currency that the, the Continental Congress was giving out, these Continentals, as they were called. So this money given by the Dutch, negotiated by John Adams, was extremely important by a lot to keep the war effort going financially. And with the war the the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War, it took some forces away. British had to fight the Dutch, and those were forces that could not be sent to the United States. So now France. In December 1775, the head of French diplomatic society sent a secret messenger to fill out the Continental Congress. He met with the Committee of Secret Correspondence, and really got the idea of what they were planning on doing. Early in 1776, Silas Dean was sent to France by Congress in a semi-official capacity to induce the French government to lend its financial aid to the colonies. On arriving in Paris, Dean at once opened negotiations with the head of diplomatic relations, securing the Rodrigue Holtes and Company the shipment of arms and munitions to America. This company was formed to allow kind of like a, a, a third party, so the French couldn't be completely tracked through this. It was the, All the arms and ammunition would be moved through this company, but it was really the French given the arms and ammunition. He also enlisted the services of a number of continental soldiers of fortune, along whom were Lafayette, Baron Johan de Klaub, Thomas Conway, Kamiska Polensky, and Baron von Steuben. Lafayette being the most famous and... We will talk about him in much detail in the battles. We talked about him at the Battle of Brandywine while he was wounded, and he continued to fight. In December of 1776, Benjamin Franklin was dispatched to France as commissioner for the United States, and he would remain there until 1785. Up against the British power, the United States lacked arms and allies, so it turned towards France. France was not directly interested in the conflict, but saw it as an opportunity to contest British power by supporting a new British opponent. The negotiations conducted first by Silas Dean and then by Benjamin Franklin, France began to support the Patriots' cause. Secretly approached by Louis XVI and France's foreign minister, the Comte de Vergans, 
they were authorized to sell gunpowder and ammunition to the Americans for close to a million pounds under the veil of the company we talked about before, Rodrigo Hortez Air Company. The aid given by France, much of which passed through the neutral dust West Indies, contributed to George Washington's survival against the British onslaught in 1776 and 1777. So here are these two, these two treaties, these two alliances, well, there's treaties yet, but these two abilities of these two nations allow the United States to, war, to continue this war. The Dutch are supplying money, the Dutch are supplying ports. The French are supplying supplies, and they're moving through the Dutch ports in the West Indies to the United States, allowing Washington to continue this war in the early parts. This aid was also a major factor in the defeat of General Burgoyne's expedition in the Champlain Corridor that ended in his disaster at Saratoga, which we discussed a couple episodes ago. French ports accommodated American ships, including privateers and Continental Navy warships, that acted against British merchant ships. France provided significant economic aid, either as donations or loans, and also offered technical assistance, granting some of the military strategists so that they could assist Americans' troops, train these farmers into becoming actual fighting men. Silas Dean, appointed by the Americans and helped by French animosity towards British, attained unofficial aid, started in early 1776. However, the gold was the total involvement of France in the war. A new delegation, composed of Franklin, Dean, and Arthur Lee, was appointed to lobby for the involvement of European nations. Franklin, aged 70, and already well-known in France, intellectual circles, for his scientific discoveries, served as chief diplomat with the title of minister. The term ambassador was not used. He dressed in rough frontier clothes rather than formal court dress, and met with many leading diplomats, aristocrats, intelligence, scientists, and financiers. Franklin's image and writings caught the French imagination. There were many images of him sold on the market, and he became the image of the archetypal new American and a hero for aspirations for a new order inside France. When the international climate at the end of 1777 had become tenser, Hasburg, Austria requested the French of France in the war of Bavarian succession against Prussia and aligned with Franco-Austrian alliance. France refused, causing the relationship with Austria to turn sour. Under these conditions, the United States couldn't ask Austria to assist France in a war against the British. Attempts to rally Spain also failed, as Spain did not immediately recognize potential gains, and the American revolutionary spirit was seen as threatening to the legitimacy of the Spanish crown in its own American colonies. Public opinion in France was in favor of open war, but King Louis and his advisors were reluctant due to the possible risks and heavy expenses involved. The king's economic and military advisors, in particular, remained reluctant. The French navy was being rapidly rebuilt, but there were doubts at how ready it was for serious conflicts. Financiers Turgot and Necker warned war would be very expensive for France's wobbly system of taxation and finance. The Americans argued that an alliance of the United States, France, and Spain would assure a rapid defeat of British, but intelligence and diplomatic sources in France waited until the navy was ready, or they hesitated. On July 23, 1777, they decided it was time to decide either total assistance with war or abandonment of the nation. The choice, ratified by the king, was war. With the defeat of Britain at the Battle of Saratoga and growing rumors of secret British peace offers office to Franklin, France sought to seize this opportunity to take advantage of the rebellion and abandon negotiations with Holland to begin discussions with the United States on a formal alliance. With official approval to begin negotiations on a formal alliance given by the king, the colonies turned down a British proposal for reconciliation in January of 1778 and began no negotiations that would result in the signing of the Treaty of Amnity and Commerce and the Treaty of Alliance. The Treaty of Alliance was in fact an insurance policy for France which guaranteed the support of the United States if Britain broke the peace that it had with France either by direct hostilities or by hindering her commerce and navigation as a result of the Treaty of Commerce. The treaty noted the terms and conditions of the military alliance, established requirements for the signing of future peace treaties to end hostilities with the British, and provided for further nations, namely Spain, to join the alliance if they wanted. 
The first articles of the treaty establish a general alliance between the two nations. Article 123 stipulates that in case the war broke out between France and Britain during the continued hostilities of the American Revolution, a military alliance would be formed between France and the United States, which would combine each respective military force and efforts for the direct purpose of maintaining the liberty, sovereignty, and independence absolute and unlimited of the said United States, as well in matters of government as in commerce. Article 4 rather further stipulates that the alliance should continue for any particular enterprise indefinitely into the future. So this was a treaty for the for, for forever. But forever they would be allies. Articles 5 through 9, which were labeled the terms and condition of peace treaties with England, this portion of the treaty preemptively divides any lands obtained from Great Britain by successful military campaigns or concessions made by Britain in peace treaties to end hostilities with the signing of nations. The United States was ex effectively guaranteed control of any land that it could gain possession of in North America, besides the islands of St. Pierre and Molochran, which France had retained possession of after the Seven Years' War, and Bermuda, since the King of France renounced forever the possession of islands of Bermuda as well as any part of the continent of North America, which before the Treaty of Paris in 1763, or in virtue of that treaty, were acknowledged to belong to the crown of Great Britain, or to the United States, called the British colonies, and the king. In return, the king was guaranteed any of the islands situated in the Gulf of Mexico, or near the Gulf, of which France could gain possession. Additional clauses ensured that neither France nor the United States would seek to make any additional claims for compensation for their services during the conflict, that neither side would cease fighting or sign a peace treaty with Britain without the consent of the other nation, and insurances that the independence of the United States would be recognized by British. Article 10 of the treaty, of the largely neglected at Spain, invited any other nations who may have received injuries from England to negotiate terms and conditions for joining the alliance. Article 11 is a pledge to honor land claims. It pledged to honor the land claims of both nations forever into the future, with the United States guaranteeing full support of France's current land claims and any lands it acquired during the war against all other nations and France. In turn, France pledged support for the American land claims and guaranteed to help preserve the country's liberty, sovereignty, and independence, as well as matters of governments and commerce. Article 12 through 13, effectively the dates of the treaty, ratification, and signing delegates. Article 12 establishes the agreement as a conditional treaty that would take effect only upon a declaration of war between France and Britain, and it made the land and diplomatic guarantees laid out in the treaty dependent upon the completion of the American Revolutionary War and a peace treaty that formally established each nation's possessions. On February 6, 1778, Benjamin Franklin and two other com commissioners, Arthur Lee and Siler Dean, signed the treaty on behalf of the United States and Conrad Alexander Garrod signed on the behalf of France. On March 13, 1778, France informed Britain of its signing of the treaties and subsequent recognition of the United States as an independent nation. Four days later, Britain declared war on France, thereby bringing the French and the American Revolutionary War. Their entry led to a significant escalation, as what otherwise had been a lopsided colonial rebellion became a much larger, more complex geopolitical conflict with one of the world's premier superpowers. After the signing of the treaty, an influx of French arms, munitions, uniform provided for the Continental Army, while the military actions in the West Indies and elsewhere forced Britain, Britain to redeploy troops and naval units away from North America colonies to secure other holdings. We will look at the military efforts of France on land and sea during the Revolutionary War in a separate episode to give them the time and justice they deserve. Because they went as far as fighting in India to pull troops away from the United States. The friendly relations between the United States and France would not last, as they would, be, they would deteriorate over the course after the war. Almost immediately after the signing of the Treaty of Paris in 1783, which ended the war, Americans began to question whether the lack of an end date for the military alliance had essentially created a perpetual alliance between the United States and France. Those Americans who disliked the proposition of being eternally tied to France, most notably the Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton and his supporters in the Federalist Party, seized on the French Revolution as a chance to officially nullify this treaty. 
Despite a consensus of European monarchs who considered the treaty nullified by the execution of the king during the French Revolution, President George Washington sided with his Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson and declared that the treaty was still in effect, notwithstanding the regime change in France. Although the Washington administration had declared that the treaty remained valid, President Washington's formal proclamation of neutrality and the subsequent Neutrality Act of 1794 effectively invalidated the military provisions of the treaty and touched off a period of increasingly deteriorating relations between the two nations. The efforts of the new French minister, Edmund Charles Jeannette, to raise mil militias and privateers to attack Spanish lands and British warships during the Citizen Gannett Affair and, despite Washington's pledge of neutrality, turned public opinion against the French and led to the resignation of Thomas Jefferson, a longtime supporter of the French cause, as Secretary of State. In turn, the signing of the Treaty of London in 1794, or Jay's Treaty, convinced many in France that the Americans were treacherous, having surrendered to British demands and abandoning their French allies despite the assistance that had provided the United States in their own fight for independence during the American Revolutionary War. The alliance was further attacked in President Washington's farewell address in which he declared the United States was not obligated to honor the military provisions of the treaty and furthermore warned Americans of the dangers of the same kind of permanent alliances that the United States was currently engaged in with France as a result of the Treaty of Alliance. The growing public sentiment against the treaty peaked during the president of John Adams when revolutionary France refused to receive American envoys and normalized relations. This resulted in the treaty being annulled by Congress in July 7, 1798. French seizures of American naval vessels during the French Revolutionary Wars led to the Quasi-War and further tensions between the Allies. The Treaty of Montfortin of 1800 would bring an end to the conflict and would formally abrogate the Treaty of the Alliance. They would normalize these relations. So this, this great treaty between the United States and, the, and France that originally was set up as this permanent treaty, of course, after the war, people, why, why do we need this? The war is over. Why do we need to continue? Why do we, do we have to support France militarily when the treaty had said so? And the United States citizens were very much against that. Being tied back into these British, these these European wars as they had in the French and Indian War. Remember, there's a big, they, they took the brunt of the French and Indian Wars casualties uh, during that time. So this was still a sticking point. They didn't want to be embroiled in these European wars with this treaty. So they kind of, it tested the alliances. In 1800, they, they kind of went back to being friends, but there was some, very sketchy times there for a minute. Now we get to Spain. And Spain aided the United States from about 1776 to 1778 unofficially. Uh, Spanish aid was supplied to the new nation through four main routes from French ports, which were funded by the Rodriguez, Hotelas, and Company, as we discussed earlier, through the port of New Orleans and up the Mississippi River from the warehouses in Havana, from Babablo through the Goretti Family Trading Company. Spain's made loan to the United States through separate houses, which supplied the Patriots with 215 bronze cannon, 30,000 muskets, 30,000 bayonets, 512, 314 musket balls, 300,000 pounds of powder, around 13,000 grenades, 30,000 uniforms, about 4,000 field tents during the war. Smuggling from New Orleans began in 1776 when Charles, John, Charles Lee sent two Continental Army, the Army of the United States, officers to request supplies from the New Orleans governor, Louis de Gonzaga. Gonzaga, concerned about overly antagonizing the British before the Spanish were prepared for war, agreed to assist the rebels covertly. Gonzaga authorized a shipment of desperately needed gunpowder in translation brokered by Oliver Pollock a patriot revolutionary and financier. When Bernardo de Galvez de Madrid, Count of Galvez, was appointed governor of New Orleans in 1777, he continued and expanded the supply of operations. As the American diplomat Benjamin Franklin reported from Paris to the Congressional Committee of the Secret Correspondence in March of 1777, the Spanish court quietly granted the rebels direct admission to the rich, previously restricted port of Havana under most favored nation status. 
which allowed them to be protected, another port in the Caribbean that they could put into when they needed to. Franklin also noted that the same report that 3,000 barrels of gunpowder were waiting in New Orleans and the merchants had orders to ship them whenever they could. The Spanish-Portuguese War of 1776 and 1777 proved successful for Spain. In the first treaty, signed on October 1, 1777, after Mary I of Portugal had dismissed Pombal, Spain won the Bamba Oriental, Uruguay, with Colonia del Sacramento, founded by Portugal in 1680. Spain also won the Missions Al Natas. In return, Spain acknowledged that Portuguese territories in Brazil extended far west of the line set in the Treaty of Todalas. In the Treaty of El Pardo, signed on 11 March 1778, Spain won Spanish Guiana, which was administered from Buenos Aires in 1778 and 1810. With these treaties, Portugal had left the war, and in 1781, Portugal even joined the First League of Armed Neutrality to resist British seizures of cargo from neutral ships. So now Spain, Spain has freed itself up. It's fighting this war with Portugal through these treaties, through these, these ends of hostilities. They are now freed up. They no longer have to split forces. They no longer have to worry about their war with Portugal. They can worry about, are well, they going to help the continentals a little more, a little less, so they're going to join officially into the war, and it frees them up to make some decisions that they couldn't have made while still fighting the war with Portugal. Former Spanish diplomat and then ambassador to the French court, Geronimo Grimaldi, first Duke of Grimaldi, summarized the Spanish position in a letter to Arthur Lee, an American diplomat in Madrid, who was trying to persuade Spanish support to declare an open alliance with the fledgling United States. Yonasi by birth, and a shrewdly calculated politician by nature. Grimaldi demurred, replying, You are considered your own situation and not ours. The moment is not yet come for us, the war with Portugal, France being unprepared, and our cargo ships from South America not having arrived, makes it improper for us to declare immediately. So, Grimaldi is saying that they just got out of a war, they can't get into another one. Give us some time, but we're willing to help. Meanwhile, Grimaldi reassured Lee stores of clothing and powder were deposited at New Orleans and Havana for the Americans, and further shipments of blankets were being collected. By June of 1779, the Spanish had finalized their preparations for war. The British cause seemed to be at a particularly low ebb. The Spanish joined France in the war, implementing the Treaty of Rennes signed in April of 1779. So finally recuperated from their war with Portugal, they have their ships ready, their supplies ready, they're ready to join in. So let's see how they helped. They had a little f smaller military campaign than the, the French, so we're actually going to go into that in this episode, but it's still very important. In the European waters, the main goal of Spain was to recover Gibraltar and Monaco from the British, who had owned them since 1704, and to damage British trade through the actions of privateers. The siege of Gibraltar, from, that lasted from June 16, 1779, to February 17th, sorry, 7th, 1783, was the longest lasting Spanish action in the war. Despite the largest size of the besieging Franco Spanish army at one point numbering 33,000, the British under George Augustus Elliot were able to hold out in the fortress and were resupplied by sea three times. Luis de Cordova, de Cordova was then able to prevent Howe's fleet returning home from resupplying Gibraltar in October of 1782. The combined Franco Spanish invasion of Monoca in 1781, met with more success. Monorca surrendered the following year and was restored to Spain after the war, nearly 80 years after it was first captured by the British. In 1780 and 1781, Louis de Cordova's fleet captured American-bound British convoys, doing much damage to the British military supplies and commerce. In the Caribbean, the main effort was directed to prevent possible British landings in Cuba. Remembering the British expedition against Cuba that seized Havana in the Seven Years' War, other goals included the conquest of Florida, which the British had divided into West Florida and East Florida in 1763, and the resolution of logging disputes involving the British in Belize. On the mainland, the governor of Spanish Louisiana, Count Bonardo de Galvez, led a series of successful offensives against the British forts in the Mississippi Valley, first the attack and capture of Fort Butte at Manchac, 
and then forcing the surrender of Baton Rouge in Natchez and Mobile in 1779 and 1780. While a hurricane halted an expedition to capture Pensacola, the capture of British West Florida in 1780. Galvez forces achieved a decisive victory against the British in 1781 at the Battle of Pensacola, giving the Spanish control of all of West Florida. This secured the southern route for supplies and closed off the possibility of any British offensive into the western frontier of the United States via the Mississippi River. When Spain entered the war, Britain also went on the offensive in the Caribbean, planning an expedition against Spanish Nicaragua. A British attempt to gain a foothold at San Fernando de Oma was rebuffed in October of 1779, and an expedition in 1780 against Fort San Juan in Nicaragua was also successful. But yellow fever and other tropical diseases wiped out most of the force, which then withdrew and returned to Jamaica. The Spanish assisted the United States in their campaigns in the American Midwest. In January of 1778, Virginia Governor Patrick Henry authorized an expedition by George Rogers Clark, who captured the fort and Venices and secured the northern region of the Ohio for the rebels. Clark relied on Galvez and Oliver Pollock for support to supply his men with weapons and ammunition and to provide credit for provisions. The credit lines that Pollock established to purchase supplies for Clark were supposed to be backed by the state of Virginia. However, Pollock, in turn, had to rely on his own personal credit and Galvez, who allowed the funds of the Spanish government to be at Pollock's disposal as loans. These funds were usually derived in the cover of night by Galvez's private security. The Spanish garrisons in Louisiana region repelled attacks from British units and the latter's Indian allies in the Battle of St. Louis in 1780. A year later, a detachment traveled through present-day Illinois and took Fort St. Joseph in the modern state of Michigan. This expedition gave Spain some claim to the Northwest Territory, which it thwarted diplomatically by Great Britain and the young United States in their separate peace treaty in the Treaty of Paris in 1783. The Spanish also assisted at the Siege of Yorktown in 1781, the critical and finer major battle of the North American theater. French General Jean-Baptiste Donation de Vermeer Comte de la Rochambeau, commanding his country's forces in North America, sent a desperate appeal to François-Joseph-Paul de Grasse, the French admiral designated to assist the colonists, asking him to raise money in, designated in the Caribbean to fund the campaign at Yorktown. With the assistance of Spanish agent Francisco Salvador de Sangronis, the needed cash, over 500000 in Sylvan pesos, was raised in Havana, Cuba within 24 hours. This money was used to purchase critical supplies for the siege and to fund the payroll for the Continental Army. On the British side, after the Spain entered the war, Major General John Darling, the British governor and commander-in-chief of Jamaica, proposed in 1780 an expedition into Spanish province of Nicaragua. The goal was to sail up the San Juan River to Lake Nicaragua and capture the town of Grenada which would effectively cut Spanish America in half, as well as provide potential access to the Pacific Ocean because of the seas and logistical problems, the expedition proved to be a costly debacle. The expedition sailed from Jamaica on February 3, 1780, escorted by 21-year-old Captain Horatio Nelson in the Hitchin Brook. Nelson was the highest-ranking officer present, but he was, his authority was limited to naval operations. The overall commander of the captain, a uh, local rank of Major, John Polson of the 60th Regiment, who recognized young Yeltsin's abilities, worked closely with him. Polson had about three to 400 regulars of the 60th and 79th Regiments, about 300 men of the Ro Loyalist Irish Corps raised by Darling, as well as several hundred local recruits, including blacks and mosquito Indians. After many delays, the expedition began to move up the San Juan River on March 17, 1780, on April 9th, Nelson, in the first hand-to-hand -hand combat of his career, led an assault that captured the Spanish battery on the island of Bartola on the San Juan River. The siege of Fort San Juan, located five miles upstream and manned with about 150 armed defenders and 86 others, began on April 13th. Because of poor planning and lost supplies, the British soon began to run low on ammunition for the cannons as well as rations for the men. After the tropical rains started on April 20th, men began to get sickened and die, probably from malaria and dysentery and perhaps typhoid fever. Nelson was one of the first to become ill, and he was shipped downriver on April 28th, the day before the Spanish surrendered the fort. About 450 British reinforcements arrived in May, 
but the blacks and the Indians abandoned the expedition because of illness and discontent. Although Darling persisted in trying to gather reinforcements, the sickness continued to take a heavy toll, and the expedition was abandoned on November 8, 1780. The Spanish reoccupied the remains of the fort after the British blew it up upon departure. In all, more than 2,500 men died, which made the San Juan expedition the costliest British disaster of the entire war. Following these successes, an unauthorized Spanish force captured the Bahamas in 1782 without a battle. In 1783, Galvez was prepared to invade Jamaica from Cuba, but these plans were aborted when the British Britain sued for peace. The reforms made by Spanish authorities as a result of Spain's poor performance in the Seven Years' War had proved generally successful. As a result, Spain retained Menorca and West Florida in the Treaty of Paris and also regained East Florida. The lands east of the Mississippi, however, were recognized as a part of the newly independent United States. And there we have it. We have the United States, a fledgling little country. On its own, it may not be able to defeat the big British Empire. But after its successes in the Battle of Saratoga, its ability to stand toe to toe, though losing in the in the battles, the campaigns of Philadelphia, showed the international powers that they could win the war, and it had them join. France's support, which we will go more into another episode, thousands of troops, ships, as we saw supplies already, allowing them to use this this company they set up as a front company to move these supplies, Spain moving money, moving troops from New Orleans and Baton Rouge and up the Mississippi, the Dutch giving these humongous loans, which allowed the Continentals to pay their army. One of the major problems, as we discussed in earlier episodes, was keeping the troops in the army. You couldn't pay them. They were poor conditions. They were malnourished. They had little supplies. But this influx of money from these three foreign powers, even before they're officially in the war, allows the Continentals, even against the efforts of the British, to pay these men, to pay their officers, to buy supplies, to get supplies to them, so they can continue this war. Without these three powers, there's no way that General Washington can continue his war in 1776 and 1777. He wouldn't have had the manpower. He wouldn't have had the supplies. I can't. You can't shoot with no gunpowder. You can't fight with an army that left leaves. It would have just been him and his officers standing on their horses going, hey, don't go there. But the official entrance into the war, it changes things. Right now, the war is in the Americas. Right, it's it's in the colonies. It's in it's in New England. It's in all your colonies here. When France, when Spain officially enters the war, even the Dutch, when they officially enter the war, Britain now has to take its troops and its supplies and put them in other places. It cannot continue to send all of them to the United States. They have to send them to Gibraltar. The Gibraltar siege fails, but it occupies a large contingent of naval forces, supplies, and troops of the British. These attacks in the Caribbean and South America, they cost troops, supplies, that aren't going to the United States. You now have a diminished army of Britain inside the United States. It's not getting the troops it was in 1776. It's not giving the supplies that it was getting in 1777. It can't. It can't afford it. It has to go other places. And as we look into France's larger military campaign, it not only has to send it to South America, Caribbean, and Gibraltar and the Mediterranean, it's got to send them all the way to India because France will fight in India. It'll start a ground war in India supporting uh, one of the former rulers there, and it'll cause the, the Britons to send all of these troops all over the world. So they're technically fighting a world war just to keep the United States as colonists. And this allows the Americans time to get troops trained, get equipment, get these troops ready to go, and they're now fighting a less prepared, less reinforced, and less supplied British army. They become the weaker force because they're not getting the supplies. The British still have the training. They still have the experience. But they're not getting reinforcements in, of new men because they have to be sent other, way, other places in the world. They're not getting 
as much naval power because it has to stay on the seas to defend against the French and Spanish navies. They're not getting the supplies because they have to go other places, the food, the rations, the ammunition. So now the British Army in the United States has started to become an undersupplied force. And as they start to limit their engagements, that's why we see a shift of major battles going from the north where they know they have little support in the way of loyalists to the south where they think they have a larger supply of loyalists so they can count on these loyalist militias instead of having troops coming in from other British ports. And that's where we're, that's where we're going to end for today. I thought this was a really important step back from military outlook. We could have gone to the next battle, but the Battle of Saratoga and Philadelphia kind of cement the fact to the international community that yes, the Americans can stand toe to toe, we should support them, and bloodying the British at the same time for these other these other European powers is good. A weaker British, or the weak British military and navy is good for France and Spain. It gives them more power in the region. It allows them to take places. It allows them to move more freely. Though the Dutch would come out weaker, they would still have an ally in the United States. There are some smaller alliances that did happen. Um, Morocco is uh, allied with the United States, allowed them to use their ports. And it was the longest lasting alliance because there really wasn't much. You could use our ports, you're protected in our ports. There wasn't much to do with there. So they didn't have, like the French, they didn't have anything that was going to make everybody mad after the war was over. But now we set up the French. They're in it. They're ready to fight for with the Americans. The Americans have stood toe-to-toe. -to -toe. The battles are going to shift to the southern colonies. Eventually, we'll get to Yorktown, where the, battle, the last major land battle in the United States is fought. But that will be next episode. Next episode, we will take on the southern... We we'll started Valley Forge, and then we're going to start on the southern campaigns of the battles. And then we'll discuss... If we have time in the next episode, we'll discuss the French military efforts, both in the United States and abroad, in places of India and Gibraltar and on, on, on the high seas. And then after that, we should only about have about one or two episodes left for the Revolutionary War, and then we should be done with that. I could have done this in a fewer episodes, but there's so much detail that goes into these, these campaigns and political decisions that we had to break it down into a lot more episodes than I actually would have liked. I would have liked to have fewer episodes in the Revolutionary War, but we're getting the information. you got to get the best information, not just the, the cliff notes. You can go to Wikipedia and get the cliff notes, right? But that's the plan. I would like any of you who have any suggestions of what you would like to hear after the American Revolution. I have some plans, but what you would like to hear, any topics you would like to hear about after the American Revolution, please feel free to send us a message on Facebook. I'm starting to set up where we can message in a different way, but right now it's just on Facebook. So you check out our Facebook page. It's the History Desk. Just search the History Desk on Facebook. Same cover art so that you don't get confused. The same cover art with the pen. Send us a message. You have a topic you want to hear about after the Revolutionary War that you want to explore, let me know. And we'll, I'll do the research, and we'll get it in there. I do want to do eventually the history of the Texas Rangers, because that's very important uh, in the, to the United States history. And I think Mexican's history, Mexico's history as well, because there's a very big interaction with their and Indian Native American history. But that'll be down the road. But if you have any any topics that you would like to hear, please send me a message on Facebook. I'll research them, give you some dates, give you some topics. Little things, small things, big things, doesn't matter. We'll research them up and we'll get them out there for you, okay? But until next time, please support us on Facebook, social media. Share the episodes with your friends if you like the episodes. If there's something you don't like about the episodes, also send me a message. Let's make it better. I want to make it better for the listeners. But until next time, as always, I'm Jonathan. 
please keep reading, please keep learning your history, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye, everybody.